folks, we're going to make a start. I think that's on, it's on at my end, Terry. It's on at my end. It's lovely to, uh, to see you all this morning. Welcome. I hope you're uh, getting into the, the, the festive mood. I see uh, one or two slightly festive jumpers. Is that a Christmas jumper, Bill, or does it just happen to be <laughs> fairly festive? Fairly seasonal. It looks very nice anyway. Lovely, lovely to see some uh, festive cheer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, we have our Christmas services coming up in uh, the very near future. Our Carols by Candlelight is this evening. There is still some space. If you haven't booked up and you'd like to come, please do. If you want information of how to do that, these little postcards are at the back. And on the reverse is the information about the Eventbrite site, um, just to make sure that we can keep an eye on numbers. Well, as we meet this morning, we're finishing our little Advent series, that being the fourth Sunday of Advent. Um, and I'm sure we'll go into a little bit more detail, but we've been spending some time thinking about God's a great salvation plan. We've uh, considered the need. Uh, we've looked at the promise. Last week we were reminded about the announcement of uh, the good news of the baby born. And uh, this morning uh, Andy's going to take us through Isaiah chapter 53 as we see God's plan in action. But as we begin, some responses. Everything you need this morning will be up on the screen. Please do respond with the words in bold time. O Lord, open our lips. Reveal among us the light of your presence. Well, we've uh, been lighting our Advent candles uh, one by one as we've gone through each Sunday. And uh, we're on to our fourth candle, uh, the most famous Bible in the, the Bible verse around. Anyone to have a guess? What would we say is probably. The most famous Bible. You sometimes see it in football grounds. People hold up a banner. It's got something written on it. I don't know if they do it anymore. Probably they don't. Anyone to have a guess? It's not from Isaiah. It's not from Isaiah. Well, I mean, this is my, my opinion. <laughs> I think John 3.16 is probably yeah. Yeah. the most famous and well-known verse of the Bible. And it's all about, of course, God's love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And our fourth candle on our Advent wreath, this beautiful Advent wreath, reminds us of God's love, his love for his world, a love which meant he sent the light of the world into the darkness to save us. So as we remember that, we join with this uh, little Advent prayer together. Let's say together, come Lord Jesus, do not delay. Give new courage to your people who trust in your love. Give us wisdom to distinguish the ways of your kingdom from our cultural values or individual desires, that we might keep in step with your spirit. Amen. Well, uh, Father, warm welcome to those just arriving. Do come and join us. Find a pew. It's good to see you this morning. This morning is a communion service, and as part of that, we often have this prayer of preparation to remind us of the importance of setting our hearts in that right place as we come later to the Lord's table. So let's pray this prayer together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For being a service of communion, the uh, children and young people will be leaving uh, pretty much straight away. They're heading off to their groups in a moment. We'd love to see you back to join us for uh, the Christian family meal that is communion. Uh, but as the young people go, let me just pray for them and their leaders. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each individual member of our church family, for young and for old. And we give you thanks that each and every one of us is precious in your sight. As the children and young people and their leaders head over to their groups now, Lord, be with them. Help them to see more of Jesus. 
help them to understand more of his love for them. And in return, would you kindle in them a love for you, a love for your word, and a love for your world. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, stand to sing our first song as we do. Uh, leaders and, their, uh, and, and the children and young people will head off for two days. But let's stand to sing together. worthy in and of ourselves to come into his presence. We aren't in and of ourselves worthy to be called his children. And yet it is through his great love that he has made that possible. The love shown in his son, the Lord Jesus. And it's right that we come to God in confession of our sins regularly. We do that week by week here at St. Andrew's. When the Lord God comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. A moment of quiet and then we will pray together. like to, but I encourage you to pray with me. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that has passed, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of 
of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins. He'll and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. We're going to continue in an attitude of prayer as we're led in our intercessions. Let's pray. Heavenly, <coughs> Heavenly Father, creator of this amazing universe, we praise you and we thank you so much for your amazing love for us. And just as we sing about the heavenly host who praised you before the shepherds, saying glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill toward men, I pray that your Shekinah glory would be experienced through these Christmas festivities, however they're celebrated. Thank you for the many earthly ministering angels who are serving us so faithfully at this moment, for the nurses and the doctors, dentists and all the health, other healthcare workers, the teachers and other angels who support us throughout this pandemic. You instruct us to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So here we are to present these things to you with a renewed confidence in our hope and faith in you. So in our personal and combined request to you, we pray that you would release your power into these prayers. It's a mystery to us that you make prayer accessible to us all, despite all of our weaknesses of simplicity and humility. It's a mystery how you answer our prayers so powerfully through the name of Jesus. Thus we come boldly to you, Lord, with great confidence, asking you to cleanse our hearts and show us what must change in us. And so we lift these requests to you, knowing that you'll faith, you faithfully hear us, accepting that you will answer according to your will. Please pour your blessing on this neighbourhood during this precious season. You rule this earth in partnership with us, your dear children. And as we partner with you in the work that you have started, enable us to see the sad and lonely with your, your eyes, offering love and support to all who need it. Enable us to be your, your eyes, hands, feet and heart in this place. We do ask you to comfort and support those who are sick or in need. And let's just take a short pause to lift up anybody who we know as being in need of prayer. May all your precious family here today experience your blessing, touched by your presence, and help us to deepen our love for you. Enable your holy word to hone and change us into a church that exemplifies your values of integrity, of kindness, and of love. Help those of us who love you to influence others for good in this community, helping us to be salt and light, pointing others to you. Help us to be encouraging, collaborative and supportive, without judgmental thoughts to those around us. As you raise and strengthen your leaders in this parish, enable them to be servant leaders, as you, Jesus, have modelled for us. Empower them, enrich them, enable them to build up and encourage others to reach their best potential. Thank you so much for our very own church leaders, for the Andes, Andy Bowden and Andy Farmer. And we pray that you would encompass their families with your protection, Lord. Thank you for our lay readers, 
and the support they give to the parish. May this be a truly blessed Christmas for them all. Thank you for all those who support our services in this church, all the musicians, the Bible readers and the bell ringers. Also so for those who work so hard and quietly behind the scenes in administrative, prayer and supportive roles. And especially we pray for Caroline as she cares for the fabric of this church. And so we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Holy God, when angels visited the shepherds, they sang for peace on earth. Yet as we look out on your world, we see that there is still much conflict, war, injustice and poverty. Holy God, when an angel visited Mary, he whispered to her not to be afraid. Yet as we look out on our communities, we see much fear and anxiety, so much that is not as you would have it be, Lord God. Holy God, you came when you came as a baby to a refugee family 2,000 years ago. You showed the world that every human life matters, that every person's potential can be fulfilled and that there is hope for a better kind of world. As in the day, rulers and wise men made decisions of fear and hope. We pray the same will work now, uh, work together to model the behaviour and lifestyle you would want to see from those in power. Holy God, come to us again this Christmas. Come and bring your hope, your love and your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Accept these prayers. Your Son, Jesus. Alan and Bill, thank you so much for leading us in our time of prayer. As Alan mentioned, we wait in hope for the Lord, and of course this season of Advent is about waiting and about preparing. Our next two songs take us back to Jesus' first coming, as we're taken back to that borrowed stable, and as we're reminded of a boy born for us in the earth below. Let's stand to sing our next two hymns together.
Teacher, teach us, holy child. Teach us to resemble thee in thy sweet humility. Heavenly Father, as we come now to your word, we ask that you would be our teacher, that we would see, we would see more of Jesus, that we would humble our hearts under the truth of your word, and that you would challenge us and change us to be the people you would have us be by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Joe is going to come and that brings our Bible reading after that uh, and he's going to come and speak to us from the time. Today's reading is Isaiah 53, verse, chapter 53, verses 1 to 10. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord, though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Really good to see you. As Andy mentioned earlier, this is uh, week four in our series of four um, around the Advent, taking a fresh look at things. Um, and taking a fresh look at um, the, the good news. We've been away for a few days this week, um, down to visit um, Debbie's mum and dad in the New Forest. And Debbie's dad was a, a, a journalist in his previous life. He was editor of a, of a mortuary magazine called Practical Mortarist. I'm sure there's one or two of you out there who may have had a copy at some point. Um, and he's absolutely uh, fascinated, George put his down, thanks George. He, he's fascinated by news and the whole concept of news. And he's just, um, he's just got his first iPhone um, and um, somewhere or other he's managed to get to the point where he's programmed it to give him news bleeps. So if you hear a train go off, it's Sky News. If you, go, if you hear a little whistle, it's probably from the BBC. Uh, and there's another one he gets as well, which is probably Apple News, which comes through. Which at first is mildly amusing, but after a little while, as you might imagine, it does become a little bit annoying. And I was chatting to him about news and, and his obsession, and, and we were talking about how things have changed. And sometimes if you see a headline, particularly if it's a Twitter headline or something, I think it's called clickbait, where they give you a headline that's enticing you to press on it and see what comes. You sort of cynically say, I'm going to skip that, it's not worth the effort. And then sometimes you might pick up a newspaper or, or look at a, a magazine and you might get as far as the end of the first article and it doesn't really agree with what you think, so you're going to skip it. And just occasionally, 
Something captures your imagination. Just occasionally, something takes you beyond that headline and first paragraph, and you want to dig deeper. And that's what we've been trying to do over the last few weeks with a story that's incredibly familiar to us. We all know um, the, 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 the whole thing around the stable and Jesus being born and the manger and the shepherds and all those other sorts of things, which in themselves are really, really important. But they're not the beginning of the story. We have to dig deeper. So what we've been doing over the last few weeks is to look at the Advent story in four stages. We've looked at the need. We looked in Genesis 6, you may remember, um, when I talked and looked back at Noah. And at the time, God said that um, there was a great weakness in the earth. Then we moved on to the promise. Tom spoke about Isaiah. And then last week, I mentioned the announcement. And today, we're bringing it all together, talking about the plan. So back to Genesis chapter 6. So that was the need. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The need. Sin had come into the world. Man had decided to follow their own will. And a gap had begun and resurrected itself between man and God. That was not the relationship that we were designed for. And you may remember, God was deeply grieved. But that was the beginning. That's not where it finished. God was also deeply moved. In, in Isaiah 59, we read about the promise. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you, and my words that I have put in your mouth will be on your lips on the lips of your children and the lips of your descendants from this time on and forever. God made a promise, a covenant. He saw our need and he made a promise that he would fix that gap. He knew that we ourselves couldn't fix that gap. We've got to help it. That's definitely a Christmas dress. <laughs> In Luke 2, we hear about the announcement. So this is week 3. I bring you good news that will cause you great joy for all the people. We hear how the shepherds, the lowest in society, the unclean, were the first to hear the news that a saviour had been born. And as we said many times, this wasn't a reaction by God. This was part of his plan. So here we come to week four in Advent, stage four, the plan. And this plan is revealed in Isaiah 53. So 700 years before Jesus' birth, 700 years, it was announced what would happen. And I'm kind of thinking that if somebody talks about something 700 years before, and it's true, and it happens, chances were it was a plan. So this week what we will do is to dig deeper into that plan. That plan was a fulfilment of Isaiah's prophecy given to him by God. And it was through a suffering servant. And it was through the love of a father. So you might be asking the question, well, who was Isaiah and, and, and what gave him the right to, to prophesize these things? So Isaiah was born as a Hebrew in 740 BC. Um, in his adult life, he was based in Jerusalem and he had access to the royal court. So in that world, he was a kind of a, a, a fairly senior sort of person. And if you remember back to Isaiah 6, when God called him, he had uh, this fantastic vision of the heavens opening, a little bit like we heard last week about the shepherds looking at, looking at this heavenly host, this army in heaven being revealed to, uh, to Isaiah, and that's when he was called. 
And you may also remember back that any of us would be in such awe that we would fall on our knees and say, God, why have you called me? I am just not worthy. And Isaiah talked about having unclean lips and the coal being taken and touching his lips. Well, that's Isaiah. He was the man who throughout the book of Isaiah has been prophesying the arrival and coming of the Messiah. So in this chapter, in Isaiah 53, it's broken down to three or four sections. And the first one is a little bit more detail about a prophecy of the one who is to come. Who has believed our message? That's a question. Who has believed our message? Isaiah is saying at this stage that what he is about to say is so um, paradoxical, so unusual, so out of step. How could anybody believe it? And for me, that is a real um, value to prophecy. When somebody predicts something like it's going to rain at Christmas, you kind of think, yeah, we all know it's going to rain at Christmas. <laughs> but when somebody 700 years before that predicts about the birth of a Messiah and doesn't do the obvious thing saying he will come as a king and live in a palace, but that he will suffer, you have to listen. He talked about someone who the arm of the Lord had been revealed. Now the arm of the Lord is a strength thing, it's a power thing. But well, that's not how Jesus came. He came as a tender shoot, a tender plant, weak in the dry ground. Jesus came as a man incarnate, taking on the full body of a man in humble beginnings, working uh, under the tutelage as a, of a carpenter at a simple hall. Living under the rule, that backroom rule of a Roman Empire. Dry ground. He was despised and rejected. He was familiar with pain. He was avoided by people. It doesn't sound like a Messiah, the person who the Hebrews had been waiting for. Yet this was the prophecy. This is what Isaiah talked about that would happen in 700 years' time. So then Isaiah moves on and he talks about the destiny of this one to come. He will take up our pain and bear our suffering. And we know because we look back through the lens of the cross that that was true. Jesus took on our pain and bore our suffering. He was wounded for our transgressions. And if we go back to that first week, the need, that's the transgressions, the gap that exists between man and God that only Jesus could close. And this might be a really strange thing to say, and again it's the paradoxical nature of Isaiah's prophecy. By his wounds we are healed. We have joy in that statement. By his wounds we are healed. And that's the promise, we too, the covenant. We are like sheep. We have gone astray. Each of us our own way. There is a need for atoning work. We have turned against God's way and chosen our own will. And only the Messiah can carry the burden of our sin. We too, the promise. And then Isaiah in verses 7 to 9 goes into a bit more detail around the suffering servant. Afflicted but humble. Led like a lamb to slaughter. He denied himself. And when we look back and read these words, we can think of um, the account in Matthew's Gospel of Jesus on the cross. And, and, and we can think of those nails being driven into his hands by our sins, by our iniquities, by the things that we have done. And we can slightly begin to imagine the pain that he must have been under. But it wasn't just physical pain that Jesus suffered. 
As we know from Matthew 27, and we know from Psalm 22, Jesus' words on the cross were, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So there's the gap in that love, that trinity, because of our sins, because of the need that we have created, there is that gap that Jesus has to close. He was designated a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now if you want attention to detail, and 700 years before, it would be really strange to say that Jesus was born, uh, was buried with the rich. Why would that happen? And yet we know from um, Matthew and Luke's Gospels that Jesus was buried in the grave for Joseph of Arimathea, which was just on the outskirts of the city. So he was buried in a rich man's grave. Anyone else would have been buried anonymously. Anybody who wasn't a rich man hadn't, hadn't bought their plots many years in advance, probably for their family, would be buried anonymously. So when you read through Isaiah's prophecy, there aren't any lucky guesses in here. Isaiah is prophesying, proph prophesying detail that we know came true. Though he had done no wrong, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Jesus never sinned. Jesus never experienced violence. He was that perfect sacrifice. And we can see that when we look back through the cross, through Jesus' life, of what the words Isaiah had said. And when I read through this chapter, I read through verses 1 to 9. And I'm thinking, wow, isn't it amazing how Isaiah, 700 years before, prophesied these things? How Isaiah got, because he, the word came from God, details that were unimaginably correct at a later stage. And I read through this and think, wow, that's just amazing. That I, I, I think back to the need that we had because we'd fallen short, the promise that God had made, the announcement of uh, Jesus' birth, and I see all that prophesied in Isaiah. And then I come to, to verse 10. And there is a danger that if we take a 21st century and click on and read the headline of this verse, it says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And when that's taken in isolation, you think, how could that be the work of a loving father? How could that possibly be representative of God's love for us? The Lord's will to crush him. But when we look back through the cross, when we read scripture and open our minds, when we move away from the smallness of our own brain, perhaps we think of how could a father kill his son and limit it to that. The love here is because that sacrifice was made for every one of us. Every one of us that has passed and every one of us in the future who wants to call on Jesus' name. And that's how much God loved us. Jesus' soul was an offering for sin, the perfect sacrifice. Because God loved and loves each one of us. This was God's plan and it was made in love. We can't just click on that one headline and think, oh, well, God's not a loving father. I've heard sort of one lines in isolation thrown at me by non-Christians. Perhaps sometimes uh, people who believe that uh, they have intellectually studied scripture and they throw one lines back at me. And my challenge to them is, is that if you're going to take the time to read scripture, don't take one line at a time. As important as that is, but look at it in context and see how scripture interprets scripture. 
And as Andy mentioned this morning, when he lit that candle, that God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Sometimes I struggle to see where God is in something. Perhaps something's happened and I can't see it. Perhaps sometimes I feel a bit distant from God's love. I know in my heart that it's because I'm facing the wrong way. It's not that God's not there. But there are a couple of verses of scripture, that being one of them, and another one I'll share in a minute, which are my go-to places. When you really want to know how much God loves you, Read John 3.16. And if you need any more evidence of that, turn to Romans 8, verses 31 and 32. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave up for all us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? This was God's plan from the very beginning. He saw the need, how we had fallen. He made a promise that he would close and fix that gap, that he would reconcile us back to him. We saw that when it was announced the good news that Jesus was born. And when we read Isaiah, we realize in that detail that it was a plan, not a response. So for the last four weeks, we've looked at the Advent story in, in different ways. We haven't just clicked on baby born to virgin in Bethlehem. We've gone back to look at the how and the why. We've gone back to look at how we have fallen. We've gone back to look at how it was predicted and prophesied 700 years before. And that is the good news. And my challenge for each one of us is when we look at good news, how will we now respond to the good news? Are we just going to click on that headline? Are we just going to ignore it? Are we just going to think of baby born of Bethlehem, Christmas, this is quite familiar to me? Or are we going to dig a little deeper and realise that there was a need and realise that God made a promise to fulfil that need and realise how much God loves us? So don't skip the good news. Well, the metaphorical bleep is often you phone that there's a headline that Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. Don't just skip it. Or if you see that headline, don't just read the first paragraph. But I would encourage you to dig deeper and see how that baby in Bethlehem was the result of a plan. God's plan because he loves us so much. And that has been expressed in grace. And in faith, we need to accept that grace as his gift. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you know Jesus and you've accepted him in your heart as your saviour, give him glory this Christmas in whatever that might be. Give him glory for what he has done for you. Give the Father glory for the expression of his love through Jesus. And for some who are hearing this message, maybe not for the first time, but maybe hearing it in a slightly different way, don't let it stop there. Don't skip the headline. Don't just read the first paragraph. Dig deeper. Talk to someone. 
Pray to God. Look for that good news in your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we were, when we were so far away, you saw the need. When we were broken and not the people who you designed us to be, you saw that need. And you made a promise that you would save us. We thank you for the announcement, the good news of Jesus being born. And we thank you as we read Isaiah, that was always your plan. Your plan because you love each one of us. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Andy. How will you respond now? Well, now there's an opportunity to respond. Maybe that's uh, quiet in your own hearts. Maybe you'd like to stand and join in our next song. It's a song that picks up on many themes from uh, Isaiah, not chapter 53, but uh, chapter 9, as it describes the coming Saviour who will be the wonderful counsellor, the everlasting Father, the mighty God, the living Word. Please use this uh, song as a chance to respond yourself to what we've heard. As we sing together, you are the mighty king. Son into the world, that we're able to gather around his table, that we're able to call God our Father, Abba, Father, that we can call Jesus our friend and brother, that we can address one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So we welcome to the Lord's table all who believe and trust in Jesus. You're very welcome to join us if you would like to in a few moments when uh, you're encouraged by the side's people. Uh, can we ask you to queue down the middle in a single file? Receive a wafer. If you step to the side, you might like to dip the wafer in the wine. We can't share the couple of moments. Receive communion, then head back down the side aisle to your pews. We begin this uh, part of our service with the peace. And we remind, aren't we, that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. 
Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. I've had to adapt various ways of sharing peace. Please smile, wave, elbow bump, fist bump those around you as we share the Lord's peace with one another. Perfect timing as the youngsters come and join us again. Welcome, folks. Do come on in. Friends, the Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places. And now we give you thanks because of your Son, our Lord, who was awaited by the prophets, announced by an angel, conceived by a virgin and proclaimed at last to men and women of every race. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ your Son, our Lord. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Except through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing, Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. Look upon us in mercy, not in judgment. Draw us from hatred to love. Make the frailty of your praise a dwelling place for your glory. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Amen. We are one body, because of your bread. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. 
Please be seated and uh, wait for the sides people to direct you to the front. If I can have the musicians first, if you'd like to come up to receive communion, please do. to the Father's love, we pray together the prayer after communion. 
Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come towards the end of our service, we're going to sing together one more time in just a moment. But can I uh, uh, encourage you to uh, think about all that Andy has shared with us this morning. Think about our response. Uh, it might be a very personal thing that uh, you're walking through with the Lord at the moment. It might be that you'd really value uh, the prayer and counsel of other uh, Christians around you. Please know that there will be folk to pray uh, with you or for you in the Drake Chapel here behind me on my left. You're right at the end of the service if you would like to. It might be that you simply want to share this good news of what uh, God has done for us in Jesus. And uh, next term we'll be running our new Christianity Explored course. And maybe there's someone this Christmas you could take one of these flyers and pop it into their hands and say, come along with me and let's find out about this good news, this Father's love expressed through his son Jesus. It's a, a short seven week course walking through the pages of Mark's gospel uh, and helping us to see the person of Jesus and the work he has come to do. So why not think about someone you can invite along in the new year. All the details are on these cards. Well, appropriately, as we think about telling others the good news, our final song is a great hymn of praise. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Let's stand to sing together. Take a moment to quiet in our hearts. <clears throat> May God the Father who loved the world so much that he sent his only Son give you grace to prepare for life eternal. Amen.
And God the Son, who comes to us as Redeemer and Judge, reveal to you the path from darkness to light. Amen. May God the Holy Spirit, by whose working the Virgin Mary conceived the Christ child, help you bear the fruits of holiness. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. So in the knowledge of God's great promises that are yes in Christ, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.